The Holy Gospel, according to St. Mark, the first chapter. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As many of you know, uh, I played uh, four years of, of college football. And something you may not know about those four years of college football and about that football team is that we were bad. <laughs> really, really, really bad. For many years, the team had been bad before I got there. We were bad when I was there. Right? And I had, I had played for, for good teams. I had been part of good teams and, uh, in high school and been on the um, winning side of a lopsided score. <laughs> College was my time to be humbled, right? to be on the losing side of a lopsided score. And there's one game in particular, my sophomore year of college, we were playing our arch rival. Concordia Mequon, and it was bad. <laughs> it was really, really bad. I think the final score was something like 84 to 7. Oh, it was bad. And at halftime, uh, you can understandably, uh, or you can understand why some of the team was just, well, down, right? Heads down, frustrated, mad, angry. Uh, it wasn't quite up to 84 at that point, but it was getting there, and we, all, all signs are pointing <laughs> in that direction. And I was doing my best to be positive, uh, encourager, and, and, and optimistic in the midst of, of a really tough time, right? And so I was going around giving people put-ups, right, uh, encouraging them. Uh, there was... The times during the second half where the score was getting even more out of hand and, and I'm running up and down the sidelines cheering, cheering on our team, encouraging. There was one point where uh, I, I played offense, but there was one point our defense was on the field and in between plays, I ran out to the huddle and was like, come on guys, you can do it. And then I ran off the field and I'm pretty sure that that is a legal substitution penalty, but when it gets that out of hand, the refs are just like, and we're done calling those sorts of penalties. And, and was trying, because here, here's what I believed, here's what I knew from my years playing in the high, high school football for a winning team. I knew the coaches were doing the best they could. They, they loved us, they cared for us. And I knew that we as players had to, had to buy in to the coaches and support them if we were ever going to turn a page as, as a team and get better. A couple months later, we had a team meeting and our, football, our head football coach uh, came into that meeting and he had just gone to a conference uh, in California. My college was in Chicago, but he had gone to a coaching conference in in California, and, and he told them about pretty much how bad we were, but how 
optimistic and encouraging. And, 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 and there's this one, one guy on the team, Larry McGurr, and he is running out and sharing, you know, spreading, spreading good news and encouraging people and, and trying to be the, the cheerleader of the team. And I was like, okay, where's this going? One, and then he tells us, he says, well, how, how did you get your players in the midst of such a terrible defeat to be optimistic? And I still remember his words. I brainwashed him. <laughs> it took me a minute to process. Like, did I just hear what I thought I heard? <laughs> that, that coach, a couple months later, ended up leaving to take another coaching position somewhere else. And between those two things, I, I realized he didn't love us. He didn't care for us. We're just pawns in his career path, in his game. He deceived us. I felt deceived. I felt like a fool. I felt hurt. I felt angry. I mean, even, even thinking of this story as I was preparing the sermon, I was like, I, I had to stop and be like, Lord, you've forgiven me. Thank you, Jesus. I forgive this person. I, I give this to the cross. I still have some hurt in my heart, right? It hurts to be deceived. To be made a fool of. Have you ever had that in life? I know you have at some point. Uh, maybe, maybe it's uh, <laughs> an email scam, right? And we make fun of, you know, the, the uh, Nigerian prince that sends an email asking for money and that, that sort of stuff. But the reality is email scams or scams happen. And if people didn't fall for them, if people didn't, uh, didn't uh, become deceived by them, they wouldn't, they wouldn't happen, right? And so uh, maybe, maybe that's happened to you. And you've seen your credit score plummet because of that deception. Maybe a friend, a friend at school, someone uh, you thought was your friend, went around spreading rumors, talking behind your back, talking trash on you, and you realize heh, they actually weren't your friend. You were deceived, and it hurt to be deceived. Maybe you had been promised at work, promised that promotion. Next year, next year, you will get that promotion. Next year, you'll get more authority. Next year, you'll get the respect that you worked so hard for. Next year, you'll get the increase in pay. And next year never comes. You are deceived. It hurts to be deceived. And we can actually even deceive ourselves. Let's turn to God's Word. See what God's Word has to say about deception and about truth. Today, today our sermon is in James chapter 1. If you want to turn there, at some point I'll be walking through that text. But a little introduction here. Uh, uh, we are starting a new Lenten sermon series, series that I've uh, entitled Giving It Up, right? And so uh, during Lent, these, these 40 days-ish leading up to a Holy Week, leading up to Good Friday, leading up to, to Easter, Lent, uh, we oftentimes associate that as a, as a season, as a season of, of fasting or of self-denial, a season in which we Give something up for Lent. Maybe some of you have given something up for Lent. I've talked to a few of you. Someone's told me they've given up social media for Lent. Uh, there's people who, have give, who give up chocolate or give up um, um, various foods for, for Lent, right? So maybe that's you, maybe not. But we typically, as in the Lutheran Church at least, associate Lent as a season of giving things up. Lent's also 
a season of repentance. A season in which we focus on repentance. Repentance is a, one of those big church words. right? In, the, in Hebrew, the language that the Old Testament was written in, in Hebrew, the word used for repent literally, woodenly means to turn around. So you're walking one way, and you repent, and you are walking the other way. You turn around. In Greek, the language of the, the New Testament, the word that gets translated as repent means to change your mind. Think differently. You are thinking this, now you're thinking that. You're thinking one thing was true, and then you realize, actually, no, something else is true. To think differently, to, to repent. And so Lent is both a season that we give things up, that we fast, that we have self-denial, and it's a, a season when we focus on repentance. I should say the whole Christian life, Luther tells us this, the whole Christian life is a life of repentance, daily repentance, but we focus on repentance during Lent. And so that's where combining those two things I kind of came up with this idea of giving it up, but we won't focus on giving up chocolate or social media or whatnot. What we'll focus on is the things that we give up in repentance. And specifically today, we'll focus on giving up those deceitful desires. James, in our text, James 1, verse 9, excuse me, verse 12, starts out by saying, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. That's, that's, you know, what does James want, James want us to take from this? What does he want us to do to remain steadfast, to, to be unmovable, to hold to the, the faith? And trials will come. James is a realist. The Bible is written in this world. The Bible is realistic. Trials will come. James does clarify trials, or, or specifically temptations. They don't come from God. I shouldn't blame the Lord. God made me do it, right? Um, what does he tell us? He tells us that temptations come from within. This is interesting to me uh, because sometimes we think about temptations coming from the world. Sometimes we think about the temptations coming from the from the devil, and, and that is true. But at the end of the day, ultimately, we are responsible for our actions. Our desires, our temptations come from within our heart. Sometimes our world tells us this, says, follow your heart, right? And that makes a really good bumper sticker, bookmark, ah, sweet sentimental card or poster that we, we hang on our wall. Here's, here's what I'll say to follow your heart. Don't believe it. <laughs> it's a lie. It's a deception. Our heart, our heart, Scripture tells us, it is icky. <laughs> Jeremiah 17.9 says this, The heart is deceitful. Above all things and desperately, who can understand it? Can't, we can't trust our feelings, our hearts. There's not, that's not solid ground. That's sinking sand. That, we, that if we put our hope, if we use as our life model, follow your heart, there will come a time that we are led astray, that we're deceived. And James, James goes on. He says, he says this. He says, 
each person, verse 14, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And so that's, that's where it comes from within. The things that, that we, we desire, that, that we want. Uh, then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Like James isn't pulling punches here. He's just a straight shooter. And he's saying, like, you want to you follow your heart. You want to you follow the evil desires that you have. It's not going to end well, desire leads to sin, leads to death. And the um, illustration that I've heard that I think can be kind of helpful is, is that of a bobsled. Have you ever been on a bobsled or you know, a couple people on a sled at the top of the hill? And then... For a moment there, you've got a little static friction, right? And so you're at the top of the hill, and you're trying to scoot forward and get moving. But then you just get over the hill, and then, whoo, down the, there's nothing stopping the bobsled from, from going down the hill. It doesn't matter who gets in front of it. It's going to take everything out in its way. And that's sort of how... Sin works. We have evil desires in our hearts, and if we give in to those, if we, we uh, fully capitulate, if we believe the lies, we scoot forward a little bit, and we start acting upon those evil desires, that produces sin, and then we're down the hill. Down the hill until we hit the bottom James tells us the bottom is death. That is what our evil desires can lead to. So he's warning us. Do not be deceived. It doesn't feel good to be lied to. It doesn't feel good when we recognize the life that we've been living, the things that we've been doing, the things that we've been saying, the things we've been thinking, it's all a lie. What are some ways that we can maybe deceive our, ourselves? If I just have another drink, that'll lighten the mood. that and before you know it, you get to the bottom of the bottle. You're angry. You're acting out. You're whatever. Like, that's a lie. A drink is not going to give you happiness. Maybe drugs. Maybe an affair. Huh. The lie. What's the lie that we can believe, that we can be deceived by? If my spouse can, was just a little bit more like that person. And we start acting on our lies and allowing ourselves to be deceived and spend a little too long lingering in someone's cubicle because you like the way that that person makes you feel. It's a lie. Get out. It's not going to end well. Maybe it's consumption. If I, if I can just, just buy that one thing, oh, it feels so good to go on that shopping spree, and it doesn't hurt immediately when ring up that credit card bill. If I just buy the, those new clothes, get that new car, buy the new shoes, whatever the case may be, I'll then... Be happy. It's a lie. It's a lie. And the list goes on and on. You can think of what, what are some ways that you have lied to yourself. Maybe you can look back in the past and say, Oh, I recognize that. 
realized I was lying to myself at that moment. That did not end the way I thought it would. It felt good at the moment, but it was a lie. But James then, after he talks about sin and lie and deceit and our desires, he changes his tone and he reminds them, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Right? He's not just saying this to be mean and harsh. He's not giving us a bunch of rules to be a bummer, to be a party pooper. No, there are good things and there are lies. There's truth and there are lies in this world. And every, here's what James tells us, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. If it's good, it's from the Lord. We talk about this, Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. If we who are evil can give good gifts to our kids, how much more so will our Father in Heaven give good gifts to us? Life, family, friends, purpose, identity, belonging, all of these things are gifts from God. And what's the greatest gift that God has given us? His only Son. For God so loved the world that He, what he gave His only Son into this world. When Jesus was tempted, Mark doesn't go into these details, but Matthew and Luke give us these details, he's tempted to do three things. Uh, tempted to turn stones into bread, hungry. He'd been fasting for 40 days, right? He was tempted to jump from the top of the temple and make a spectacle so that everyone could see the angels of God catch him. And he was tempted to bow down and worship Satan. How is that a temptation? Well, (laughs) think about it. Jesus' whole mission, his whole purpose was to bring life and salvation to this world. If the devil gave him all the things that he was working for, this world, the kingdoms of heaven, he could rule. He could be a beloved uh, ruler, a monarch, and and take care of us. But here's the thing. If he did that, there's one thing he couldn't do. He wouldn't do. He couldn't take care of the sin problem. He saw. He wasn't deceived. Our Lord Jesus was not deceived. He saw the lie, and he stuck with the truth. And he did all of this in our place as that perfect example of one who stands steadfast in the word of truth. Speaking of staying steadfast, our Lord Jesus stayed steadfast up to the point of death. He did not waver. He saw the cross. He knew what was before him, the pain, the suffering, the rejection, and the death. The death that he had to pay for us. And he stayed steadfast that entire time, not wavering, not being deceived. So that today we can say there's no truer statement than this Christ has died, Christ has risen. Christ will come again. That's the truth, my friends. (laughs) That's the honest truth. That's the best that I have to give you. And that is what we follow and believe in today. And so, so the question is, what do we do as followers of Jesus to keep ourselves from being deceived, to walk in the ways of truth? Well, let me first say, it's not by white-knuckling it, right? You know, white-knuckling, like grabbing onto the steering wheel real hard, trying really hard. It's not by your willpower that you're, you're going to be able to give up 
those deceitful desires that are within you. Maybe that lasts for a moment, but there's going to come a time when you don't have that strength. So how do we, how do we hold on, or, or um, I'm sorry, make sure that we're not deceived by these deceptive desires within? First of all, we identify it. Right? We, we name it. Sin is not a white lie. It's not a slip up. It's not a oopsie. <laughs> Sin is an affront to the holy God in heaven. Sin leads to death. We name it. We call it what it is. This is the same sin that Jesus died for. To free us from. To give us life and truth. And so we name it. This is why it's so important to stay in God's word regularly, daily, multiple times per day. So that when we see lies out in this world, in our life, when inside we start, oh man, it, wouldn't it be nice if we went this way or that way or had this or had that? We can see it through God's word of truth. We can see, no, that lie. I'm not going to be deceived. So we name it. We repent. Right? Matanoia in the Greek. That is think differently. Shuv in the Hebrew. Turn around. Right? So, so what, what does that mean? How, do, how does that practically play out? We say this, that repentance has two parts. It, that we first, we, we confess our sins. We confess, that's what we did at the beginning of service. We confess our sins to God. I also say, we confess our sins to one another. If you don't believe me, James 5.16, end of the book, James says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, some of our sins, they're pretty, uh, they're, they're pretty hard to confess. Maybe you, you have that trusted friend that you can confess them to. I'll also say this as a pastor at my ordination, and then again in installation here at Christ Lutheran, I made a vow. And one of those vows, part of that is this, that any sins confessed to me, I will not divulge. Know that it doesn't go anywhere when you come to your pastor, whether it be me or another pastor, and confess your sin, and he then speaks the truth of grace and gospel over it. We confess our sins, and then we... Do we do an about face? We we believe. We walk a different way. We change the way we think. We maybe pray. Maybe we flee from a certain sin. Maybe we uh, look for some accountability in life or uh, an ally, a friend who will help us and check in on us. Ask us how how are you doing in life today? So we name it. We confess it. We believe it. We believe the word of truth. This a couple weeks ago, I got to go down to Peace Lutheran Church in Arvada, where I served as pastor for a while, for seven years, and got to see a lot of people that, from my past. And one family in particular I was talking to, um, family that was really good to our family, that we were close friends with, uh, parent, their, the parents, and then... The daughter was there, and during our conversation, I said, and, and how, how's your son? Because what I knew from the past is that the, their son had had a troubled past. He'd gotten into addiction, uh, into alcohol addiction, some gangs. He was homeless for a while. Um, you know, girls left and right. He was, he was a broken person to the point where his parents had to say, we can't, we can't enable you anymore. We have to cut you off. That, I mean, I can only imagine how hard that would be for a parent to say that. And so I asked, how's your son doing? And their eyes lit up and they smiled. He's doing so well. He's been sober for several years now. 
he used to have a whole lot of tattoos, but all those tattoos were a reminder of him of his past life. And so he t spent a lot of money and went through a lot of pain to get all of the tattoos removed from his body. It was, uh, as his sister said, it was like a Saul to Paul type of conversion. And not only this, now he was on the track. He was studying to become a pastor. Ah, he recognized that his past life was deceitful, that the truth is in Jesus. I know that seems like an extreme example, but it's real. That's people I know. May we, as God's people, as followers of Christ, live in the way of truth, put to death deception, and follow Jesus, source of life and forgiveness. Amen.